So we've been making our way through 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 14 still. We've had a, a, a great like passion week. We've had a, a great time breaking bread. And man, what a, what a glorious time to be in fellowship like that, you know, celebrating Jesus and uh, just making him center of it all and, and it was such a good time. And now it's like it's, it's, it feels great to go back right with Apostle Paul as he's teaching uh, the, the Corinthians, the church at Corinth, um, well, teaching and instructing and exhorting, you know. And uh, so we're now in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and our lesson will begin on chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible and would like one to follow along with us, just raise your hand and we'll get a Bible in your hand. And if you don't own that Bible, then make, please make it a gift from the Lord to you. But I love hearing the pages just flipping. That's what I'm talking about. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20 through 40. So hold that thought, hold your finger there. We left off where the Apostle Paul had taught on the difference between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy and how they are two entirely different gifts. And uh, Paul explained that he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, that the speaking in tongues is a prayer language that is directed upward to God and is described as worship, praise, blessing, and thanksgiving to the Lord. But Paul also made it clear by saying that the gift of tongues edifies the one who's exercising the gift. And so in the church of Corinth, you had the exercising of the gift of tongues just happening everywhere, where it was all about edifying themselves. And this was one of the gifts that they held and elevated at a high, high place. Paul's point was that no one can understand what you are saying. So how can the church be edified and say amen to whatever it is that you're saying? How do they understand during the public assembly of Christ? Because we need to factor in everyone who's in that public assembly. In other words, there are those who are seeking the truth about the Lord and there are those who don't know anything yet about the Lord, but they are there because they want to get to know him. And of course, there is the body of Christ in the public assembly. They made service about themselves, parading themselves around, if you remember those words, puffed up, parading because they were exercising these gifts that they held at a very high place. They were elevated. And Paul was like, no, no, no. You need to factor in all who are in that public assembly and exercise the gifts that these people would understand to appreciate what the Lord is saying to them. Such a, as prophecy, because it is spoken in a known language that everyone would understand. So when, when someone stands there and they receive a word from the Lord, they're not going to receive it in Hebrew where they won't understand. No, the Lord will speak to them in their known language. Therefore, they can turn around and use that gift to edify others. So Paul, he encouraged the gift of prophecy because they elevated that gift as well. But prophecy edifies the church. We learn that the gift of tongues is a prayer language, again, directed to God, but that the other gifts are where God is speaking to man. God gives gifts such as the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge or prophecy. And all these, again, are spoken in a, in a language that we would understand. And these will edify and exhort and comfort those who are listening. In other words, they'll be able to hear the word from the Lord. And with that, they are able to understand and say, amen. Amen. That, that's a good word. Amen. I know that was spoken to me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Right? But Paul also didn't want them to go to the other extreme as he's been addressing the spiritual tongues. He didn't want them to take that and go, okay, all right, let's, now let's not use the spiritual tongues because, you know, we want to use prophecy. Let's take that. They were like ready to run and, and start running with whatever Paul said. So Paul tells them, look, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in church, again, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words 
with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Meaning he did not exercise the gift of tongues in the public assembly because he knows that it is by understanding that others would appreciate the gifts. So Paul tells the church of Corinth, he's like, look, when it comes to exercising the spiritual gifts, may they be done to edify the church. And that is the context of chapter 14, that all those who are in the church service need to be factored in. He says, don't exercise the gifts just to edify yourself. Do that in the privacy of your own devotional life. But exercise the gifts that will edify the body. So in this morning's passage, we are continuing in chapter 14. And now we will see that Paul, after writing all this in, this in his letter, is anticipating opposition against what he has been teaching this whole time concerning the gift of tongues. And so he says on 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. So again, just so we remember in the context, the church of Corinth, they just elevated those two gifts, tongues and prophecy. It was their selfish desire to edify themselves at the expense of others. So in this, they showed themselves to be like children, a manifestation of their selfish immaturity. And Paul says, look, if you are mature, you will understand what I'm saying here. And so he points them to Isaiah and quotes from chapter 28 and says, verse 21, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people and yet for all that, uh, all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Now, this is kind of one of those verses you're like, okay, what does that mean? Now, to understand what Paul is saying, we need to understand why he quotes Isaiah chapter 28. So this scripture was God announcing judgment through the prophet of Isaiah to the children of Israel that they would no longer receive the word of God through the prophets that were spoken to them in Hebrew. But rather, they will hear men speaking with other tongues and other lips. So what happened was that the children of Israel at that time had refused to listen to God's message that was proclaimed by his prophet. And because of this, God prophesied through Isaiah that another sign will come, the foreign tongue will symbolize God's rejection towards Israel's rebellion and their apostasy of what they and the religious leaders had made Judaism in, into. So God tells them, there will be men of other tongues and other lips that they will hear, and this was all about the coming invasion of the Assyrians. And that day came, just as it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Jerusalem was invaded by the Assyrians, where they heard the Assyrians' language spoken in their midst. This was to be a sign to them of God's judgment upon them, for he rejected all that they have made Judaism into. Now, Paul, he is drawing a parallel with what happened between uh, the physical sense of the uh, Israel and the Assyrians and what happened in Jerusalem. And he's paralleling that with what happened on the day of Pentecost, okay? When the foreign languages were spoken in that upper room in Jerusalem, the gift of tongues was the manifestation of a sign. And the sign was God's judgment upon the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes uh, had what they have turned Judaism into as well. So you see the parallel right there of the signs. And God bypassed it, and was establishing something new, okay, in the church. Now, if you think about it, the religious system of the Jews during the ministry of Jesus, the greatest problem and hassles that Jesus had to deal with as a Jew and as a Jewish Messiah all came from the Jewish religious leaders. Not only did they hassle Jesus and, and caused him problems, but they even plotted his death and his crucifixion. 
and they were successful with the cooperation of the Gentiles, speaking of the Romans, in having Jesus crucified. So the speaking of tongues on the day of Pentecost was evidence that God had rejected their apostate religious system that would crucify his Messiah. And God has moved on to something new to express himself to this world through his people. And please understand that this is not replacement theology. That is not what I'm saying here when I say something new. God's Holy Spirit manifests to this world through the body of Christ in our present day. That is what I meant, but Israel will always be Israel. We can't, we can't sit there and say, oh, th this is the new church now. He's gone beyond Israel and is moving without him. No, God still has a plan for the Jews and the nation of Israel apart from the church. So Israel is Israel and the church is the church, amen? The thing is, is that we are all bought by the blood of Jesus Christ into the body of Christ. So Paul's point is, on the day of Pentecost, when those foreign tongues were heard, it was a sign of God's judgment and his rejection of what they had become. Verse 22, Paul says, Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Well, that almost sounds like Paul is contradicting himself, right? Because before it was, you know, the, these, the speaking in tongues was the gift for the believers. And now it says right here, no, it's to those uh, to unbelievers. Now, just to be transparent, uh, verse 22 can have you throwing up your hands. Uh, it was tough trying to understand fully of what Paul is thinking during this progression. And I'm talking from verse 21 through 25. It has been a challenge for me to understand. So what I have to do is pay attention to something that Paul often does. And that's, look at verse 22, the, verse, the very first word he says in verse 22, you see that word, therefore. And it means that he is explaining his thought process of verse 21. And then if you look at the first word in verse 23, there's therefore again. And he is making his point for verses 21 and 22. So we see this progression of what he's aiming at. And so I usually look at those, and then I typically go to the very last sentence of this context or trying to figure it out. And, and then, you know, try to understand what his conclusion is of his thought process, and then I would trace myself way back. So here we see that he lays out an Old Testament scripture, and then he makes a statement from that verse, and then takes these points and explains his main point in, in verse 23, he says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you're out of your mind? Well, if you read verse 22, it says, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. The unbelievers that Paul speaks of in verse 22 are those he refers to in Isaiah, that's who he's paralleling. And these are those who have rejected the word of God and have closed their hearts to the truth. Tongues are a sign of God's judgment to them as they were on Israel in the Isaiah passage. So you get that from verse, uh, I believe it was 21 and 22. Now the unbelievers in verses 23 through 25 are those who are willing to be taught. They are open to hear the word of God. And we know this because of the evidence of their presence in the Christian assembly. Yet if they hear Christians speaking in foreign tongues or foreign languages without interpretation, they won't understand and it won't be a testimony to them. Rather, they would think that the saints were out of their mind. That's what crazy means, you know, out of their minds. Paul's point is that there are those in the assembly who are seeking God, who want to know about God. They, they are there for these reasons. These are hearts that have not rejected God, but are seeking him. So if they saw these tongues being exercised without interpretation, it would make them feel uncomfortable. You know, they would probably sit there and go, okay, where's the door? 
and they would probably make their way for the door. Or there may be those who will be patient and say, no, I'll just wait it out, but I'll never come back, right? And th that is something that we do not want to see happen. That is not the impression that God wants to leave on them or the impression that we as a fellowship want to leave on them either. We are about pointing everyone to Jesus so that they may find salvation. We always say one more, one more for God's kingdom, one more soul to be gained for Jesus. But if they come in and that is the impression that they receive, having no idea what is happening or what is being said, while everyone is exercising their gifts, you know, they will rightfully, I say rightfully, come to their conclusion by saying, these people are lost. They are out of their minds. They're nuts. And rather than gaining one more for his kingdom, it would cause damage for that person to have that kind of impression of the Holy Spirit. So you can see, you know, the Apostle Paul is talking about two different types of unbelievers. You have the ones that completely rejected him and you have the ones that are seeking him. And so that's how his word is divided. To those who rejected, it's a sign. For those who are, are, are seeking him, he's telling them, hey, tame that. Tame that, okay? Verse 24, he says, But if all prophecy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, we're talking that now they're using the gift of prophecy and they see this, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. Because remember, Prophecy is God's word speaking to man. So here they are listening to the prophecy. They are listening to the word that, uh, of God that is being spoken. And Paul tells us what happens in verse 25. He says, and thus, the secrets of his hearts are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Oh, that's a better impression. I remember as a brand new believer sitting in church with my friends, I was always excited to hear what the Word of God would bring. And boy, when the pastor began to teach, my attention was drawn completely at every word that was being spoken, and it never failed. As a new Christian, it never failed. It was as if God was speaking directly to me, into my life. Now, raise your hand if that has happened to you. Yeah, yeah, that's everyone. We, we've all been there where you just sit there and, and the Lord speaks directly to you. So you know what I mean. But God, through his word, was addressing things that I needed addressing. All to say that this was the spirit of the Lord dealing with me directly. He was working conviction in my heart. He had revealed these things to me that only God could have known about and that I needed to deal with in my life. And all I could do was fall on my face. All I could do was repent. I'm like, oh, I really need to, I need to work on this, Lord, you know. And I would go to my pastor at the end of the service, and I'd be like, man, everything you said behind the pulpit was directly to me. It was meant for me. And he said, well, that wasn't me. That was the Lord. Make sure you give, you give thanks to him and worship him for what he has revealed to you in his word. That was all God who spoke to you. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. That put my whole, you know, focus on the Lord. That's a good pastor. That's an awesome pastor. So through teaching, we need to understand that there is a prophetic element that is taking place where God is speaking forth through his word, unknown to the pastor, but known to the heart of the listener, where secrets become revealed, where they realize I need to get this right with the Lord. God spoke about the one issue in my life back then that no one, knew, no one else knew about. And the Lord, through that pastor, talked about 10 to 15 minutes. It was like direct having this conversation with me. But when this happens in a person's life, this is when they will realize that this was a supernatural service, that God was right there. And that's what we want in, for this church. Nobody to be up you know, center, you know, stage. Jesus and his word of God is centered stage. That's who we want to be looking at. And it's what we pray for even before we even start worship, you know, and, or the service, you know. We pray that people would come in and that their experience would be nothing that they could ever explain other than God is at work here. 
And when they leave, they will understand, hey, no one can do that. Only God can do that because of the way his word was spoken directly to them. And I truly believe that. Now, will that be everyone's experience every week? Maybe, maybe not. But what I do know is that God's word never turns void. And, and, and I have a friend that, that tells me every once in a while that, right, sitting right over there, God's word never turns void. This is what the Lord says in Isaiah 55, 11. It says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. His word does not return void. And this is what God's prophetic word does. That when they leave, they'll be thinking, you know what, you know, I'm not ready to be a Christian yet. But whatever is happening in that room, I know it's supernatural. I know it's real. And I, as the pastor of the fellowship, would prefer someone to think that way when they leave. Versus thinking that, hey, these people are cray-cray. In that fellowship, I, can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, because we're not cray-cray. Now, Paul will be give, you know, begin to give specific instructions on how the church is to allow the exercise of spiritual gifts in the public assembly. And you're going to understand, it's decently, yet in order. The Holy Spirit always works in order. And Paul will address their lack of order first. I love that about Paul. He's going to sit there and tell them, the truth. He says, how is it then, brethren, where whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, and has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So you can see that everybody was coming in already prepared to be center stage, right? So he's asking the hard question. He's confronting them on what was going on in the midst of their service. He's definitely not you know, commending them. He's not saying, hey, that's great. Everybody wants to be center stage. No. He asks, how is it that each of you, whenever you come together in service, you have all these things happening? And what was happening is that people were showing up and they were just doing whatever they wanted, when they wanted, exercising their gifts over, you know, all over the church, you know, talking over somebody. And Paul is rebuking them for the lack of order their lack of structure that was desperately needed, the order that will allow the gifts to be fully appreciated by all, whether believers or unbelievers that are in the public assembly. So now he gives instructions, specifically right now for the gift of tongues. Verse 27, he says, If anyone speaks in tongues, that there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But, verse 28, if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Further confirming, verse 2, where it said, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So that conversation can be kept silent between you and the Lord. Again, verse 28 reiterates what Paul has explained very clearly in many ways as we've been going through chapters 12, 13, and 14. That if someone wants to speak in tongues in the public assembly, assembly there must be an interpreter. If there, and if there is no interpreter, then that person is to keep silent in the church. In other words, they are to exercise control and remain silent. People have personal control with the exercising of their gifts. Paul said, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn speak in tongues, meaning no one interrupts one another. It is to be done in order, meaning there is to be control of the public service and of the tongue. And let one interpret it. And then again, if there's not interpret it, hey, it's done. You, don't, you do not practice or exercise that gift. Tongues are not to be spoken in the public assembly, if there's not an interpreter, meaning they are to exercise control. And so the person wanting to speak and, and, and wants to exercise that gift needs to be uh, quiet, remain silent between God and himself. Again, that's control. Now, can you imagine what Corinth may have looked like 
during this time, when they all jumped up and everyone spoke in the gift and tongues, speaking over one another, out of order, and there are some denominations, I'm not going to say who, but who do this today. And what ends up happening is a lot of things get blamed on the Holy Spirit where they exercise the gift so out of control and people are like running around and zapping each other and acting like, oh, you know, I just got hit, you know, and they just lose control of their bodies and collapsing. But afterwards, they say, well, it was the Holy Spirit who did that. No, that was all you. That's the blame that the Holy Spirit gets. That's the bad rap that the Holy Spirit receives. But I'm thankful that under the influence of the Holy Spirit here through Paul, you know, that we have learned that the Holy Spirit will always look like Christ. And it will always testify of him. There's peace in that, amen? The Holy Spirit will always draw your attention to Jesus. It will never draw in, uh, its attention to himself. That's how I know you're flopping on the ground like a fish out of water wasn't of the Spirit of the Lord because that is drawing attention to yourself. It's not drawing attention to Jesus. And those who are watching that are unbelievers, they will think, man, something's wrong here. Something is very wrong. And by the way, the Holy Spirit will always look and act like Jesus. Jesus never lost control of his body. As a matter of fact, he laid it down at the altar for us. Jesus was in full control as he obeyed the Lord in all things. So when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is exercising the gifts, he will always exercise them in order and under control and in a way that will always look like Jesus, the love of our Lord. Now, some of you may have been with us since we planted, or close to, and some of you have been with us for a shorter time. But most of you may wonder, well, was there ever a time that we exercised the speaking of tongues during a service? Now, I can answer to you that. In the setting here, on a Sunday morning service, and even on our Wednesday night service as your pastor, I have never opened it up during those times for the gifts to be exercised, and I won't. And I won't do it for two reasons. First, I won't allow it to be open because after worship, the gift of teaching is in operation at that time. Would you guys agree? And the Holy Spirit will never interrupt himself with the gifts of prophecy or tongues if he's using the gift of teaching. The Holy Spirit does things in order. Another reason I won't open it up, you know, in this service is because I don't want to embarrass anyone if I am forced to correct them in the public assembly and, and have it affect them for the rest of their lives where they would be like, oh, I won't ever do that again. As a matter of fact, I won't even use my gifts again. So I won't open that up in Sunday services or Wednesday studies. But that is just in those two settings. That is the public assembly. All right, There will be times that we will set times aside for an afterglow or a small group to open up for the gifts to be used. However, it will be done according to chapter 14, decently and orderly, practicing control in what we would be called, it would be called a safe environment for us all, you know, where we can not be feared or anything like that, where if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world, but we can correct one another and sharpen one another and be discipled in it and continue to grow in these things, amen? But when it comes to Sunday service, or when it comes to our Bible study where we're there to, to, to worship the Lord and we're here to, to hear his word and allow God to speak in our hearts, we're not going to have it open where somebody would just stop, step up. And I've seen it before where they would step up in the middle of talking while the preacher's talking and start speaking in tongues. I've seen it in, when I was in that one church and I was told that because I didn't do it, that I needed to be saved. But I saw it happening all around me in the midst of the assembly, in the midst of the service. And that is the reason why Paul is addressing this, because it happened back then, but it still happens today. And so Paul is saying that, hey, this is all done in order, in decency, that, you know, the practicing of the gifts. So 
He says, with the gift of tongues in the public assembly, let there be two or three at the most who speak. Now, that's if you're wanting to do it in the public assembly. He says, each in turn, let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, then they are to remain silent and keep it between themselves and the Lord. And then he says, concerning prophecy in verse 29, he says, let two or three prophets speak. And he's talking about those who have the office of a prophet, not those who have the gift of the prophecy, because we're, we're still talking about service, right? He says, let two or three prophets speak a part of the public service, and let the others judge. So anytime a prophecy goes forth in the public assembly, it is to be judged. Well, by what? First, by the word of God. It is always to align itself with the word of God. And second, it would be judged by those who have the gifts of discerning of spirits so that they can judge the spirit behind the prophecy. And then he says in verse 30, but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, you know, and there's, there's someone up here that he's given the gift of prophecy, and th there's another one who receives a prophecy. It says, let the first keep silent. In other words, let the guy talk, and the person that's going to be speaking next, the first, let him hold himself in control. If somebody's already operating in the gift of prophecy, then someone else gets that something different. That person is not to jump up and barge in and say, wait a minute. No, he's not to speak over that person who is prophesying. He is only to speak when the other person has stopped. That is done decently and in order. Again, pointing to control, where people have to maintain self-control of themselves when exercising the gifts. Not to interrupt the one speaking or to interrupt the service. Just to say what they feel that they needed to say and blame it on the Holy Spirit. It's not how it's going to work. This would be in violation of what the Bible teaches. Verse 31 says, For you can all prophesy one by one. Now this is speaking of the gift of prophecy, that we're able to prophesy one by one, again, in order, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So this is when the gathering of the saints, they're, 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 we have that afterglow. It's that sending. Prophesy as much as God wants to speak. You know, we, we all want to hear what the Lord has to say. So in those moments, you know, one by one, this is what we're talking about. They can prophesy as much as uh, the Lord wants to say or speak into that situation. Amen. Verse 32, it says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It's funny how he puts it this way, but it says, And so the gifts of the prophets are subject to to the prophets, meaning they have control of their spiritual gift and they are to be able to maintain order by the prophet. It's, it's a repetition of what Paul sings, just as those who speak with tongues can hold their own tongues. They, they maintain order, speaking one at a time without interrupting one another. Verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So as you can see, confusion was happening in the church of Corinth. And Paul says, if you want to know what a proper service is to look like, it would not have any confusion. God's not the author of confusion. Who is? Yes. Everyone would understand what was going on if it was all done in proper order. And this would bring forth peace. It would bring peace to, upon the public assembly. And that's what Paul's saying. He's, and he says in verse 34, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. So that's pretty crystal clear right there. I don't think we need to go any further than that. Let's pray. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just, just, just joking, all right? The thing about this verse is that you cannot interpret this verse that women are never to speak in the church service because in chapter 11, Paul spoke of women praying and prophesying as a good thing, but it was under the context of a head covering. So women are obviously free to pray and prophesy in the church setting, but what I believe he is saying is explained further in verse 35. He says, and if they want to learn something... Let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. 
Now, here's what he means. If you notice in verse 34, what that second word says, it says, your women keep silent in the church. Your women. So this problem was something that was happening in the church at Corinth. So if there was a problem, which there was, Paul says, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. So here's how the early church was set up. Okay, they used the same model for the synagogue that they followed, where you would have men sitting on one side and you would have the women sitting on the other side, and they didn't sit together like we do here this morning. And here, if you don't agree with something, you're sitting right next to your spouse. You're like, honey, I really don't agree with what he's saying. And your husband would be like, I agree with everything he's saying because he's good, right? <laughs> right. But here, it, you know, if we don't agree with something, we can sit there and, and, and have that little small conversation, you know. And you can lean in and you can, you can have that conversation even if you do agree or don't agree. But what was happening in that service back then, because you had the men on one side and the women on the other side, if there was something that they didn't agree with, they would call to their husband. Hey, honey, I don't agree with this. Do you? And they would be disruptive in the church at Corinth. This was happening in the midst of the teaching, the service. I don't agree with that. Do you agree with that, honey? I do agree with him. What's your problem? You know, this keep going on. Well, because you guys are going, the guys are going to agree with me. I'm just kidding. But can you imagine how even this, they would disrupt the gift of teaching? Paul points out, hey, look, you know, we see that they want to learn. So we know the issue that, they, that was happening was the questions of what they were hearing. And so he says, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. Just, hey, they, yeah, re remember those questions and, and we'll talk about it on our way home. That is the proper time and the proper place that we can do this. He says, for it is shameful for women to speak in church in a disruptive matter where it disrupts the work of the Lord during the gift of teaching being op in operation. So you can see why he would say that. He, Paul will always look at things from a pure perspective. It's never to be, oh, because she's a woman. That has nothing to do with this context. Verse 36, or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? So he's closing his thoughts here, but is anticipating some strong resistance from the people of Corinth, where they would hear him say all this stuff, all this teaching, and say, well, he has no idea what he's talking about. You know, the way we do things in our services are fine. We're prospering, because in the church of Corinth, they were prospering. So we will keep exercising the tongues and prophecy. That's kind of what Paul suspects, you know, from them, because they've, they've been doing this for a long time. And so he expects opposition to come his way. So he asks, hey, well, did the word of God originally come from you? Can you show me in scriptures where you've been so inspired by the Holy Spirit that you wrote something in the scriptures? What book did you write? Or was it only you that the scriptures had reached or this gospel had reached? He says, verse 37, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. In other words, if you are truly spiritual, not just by the manifestation of the gifts of tongues or prophecy, but if you are truly a spiritual person, this would manifest as true within your heart and your spirit, and it would bring confirmation to you that, that this is the way that God wants his services to be ran. Verse 38, but if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. The thing about ignorance is that you can't force ignorance out of a person. You can only show them, you can teach them, and you can leave it there with them. But it is up to them whether they will take it and apply it, the truth, into their lives or to remain in their ignorance. Therefore, so he's taking these thoughts. He says, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with the tongues. Now, for those who believe and hold the view that the gift of tongues are not for today, 
what do you do with this verse? What do you do not forbid to speak with tongues? What do you do with that? What he is saying, look, I may be saying desire prophecy and minimize tongues in the public assembly, but don't go to the other extreme and minimize the importance of the gift of tongues now. Do not forbid to speak in tongues. The gifts are in operation today. They are. That's why this instruction for God's word has remained and will always be the truth. But then Paul brings all the concernings, all things concerning the spiritual gifts, everything that he's been kind of talking about in the last chapter to this conclusion. And he says that all things be done decently and in order. In other words, let all things be done, but let them be done decent and in order. That is the balance. Do them in the way that God has determined that they should be done for the edifying of all those who are in the public assembly. Speaking of the Christians, the truth seekers, and those who do not know the Lord. So that they may have an encounter with God. That he may reveal himself to them. So remember, as I said, as we started chapters 12 and 13 and 14, that this was a section. Chapter 12 spoke of the many spiritual gifts that there are. Chapter 13, Paul speaks of the supremacy. It's the central chapter of all the gifts, the supremacy of love through the gifts, and that the Holy Spirit will always look like our Lord Jesus. And then in chapter 14, he addresses the two elevated gifts at the Church of Corinth and how they are to be exercised with control, decently, and in order, right? I love that Paul emphasizes love, though. He puts that right in the middle. It's that one thing that you cannot avoid seeing. It's right in the middle to be the motive of our heart and that the gifts are for the edifying of others. To be exercised out of love for God and for our fellow man. And when you think of the spiritual gifts in that manner, you see the heart of the Lord Jesus in them as well. Bottom line, we are to be a reflection of our Lord Jesus to the world. Our lives are to be walking under the power and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, who through us will always point the world to Jesus, to Christ, by our actions, by our lives, and by our words. I love this quote often seen by Francis of Assisi. He says that we are to preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. He means our lives are to be supernatural lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. How we live our lives in itself will tell a person everything they need to know about you. And it will tell the person everything they need to know about the heart of our Lord Jesus. And when they ask, well, what's so different about you? Or why are you smiling so much? Or ah, you're so nice. When they ask these questions, then it's necessary to use words. I believe that the spiritual gifts are those things that God will use in his perfect timing to draw those people to him through you. Just keep your eyes and ears to the Lord. He will tell you what to do and what to say, and he will give you what you need to accomplish what he needs to accomplish through you. Remember, his word will never turn void. It's that simple. He is the Lord, and you are the vessels that he uses. And don't complicate your relationship with God. Simplify it. Don't complicate if your gifts. If you have the gift of tongues, don't complicate it. If you don't have them, ask them when you're ready for it. And just allow the spirit of the Lord. to. There's no right or wrong way to do it. There's no language that you have to study. It's just whatever the, the spirit will grow out of you. And, and you just got to just allow the spirit to, to have its way through you. And in those moments, whatever the spirit decides it wants to say, it'll edify you. It'll build you up. And, and that's a personal devotional. That's what I, that happens in my, my prayer closet. It's a personal, provo uh, personal devotion that I do between the Lord. So keep it simple. Don't complicate it. Allow the Spirit to have its way within you. And may Jesus be glorified within you in all that you do. And may you testify of him in all that you say through the ultimate gift of the Spirit of 
of Christ who is within you. Isn't that amazing? It's powerful. The spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ dwells within you. Amen. Let us pray.